Hello, I'm Don Martin, the Executive Vice President of Series, and your MC for today's live stream Series 2020 digital program. Series is a sustainability nonprofit working with influential investors and companies from around the world on a host of global sustainability challenges, including the climate crisis and deforestation, water scarcity and water pollution, scarcity and, pollution. and equitable workplaces. Let me start today by saying that our hearts go out to all those so seriously affected by COVID-19. And we're especially grateful to those on the front lines risking so much to ensure that the rest of us stay as healthy and safe as possible. I also wanna thank each of you for participating in this program. We realize that your personal and professional lives have been profoundly disrupted, but your particip participation today demonstrates your unflappable commitment to our collective mission of building a just and sustainable economy. We also appreciate the generous support of our speakers and sponsors who have stood by us on this digital journey to reimagine Series 2020. Together, we've been able to transform our intended in-person convening to a digital program, and we clearly would not be here today without your essential support. Thank you so much. This global pandemic has not only drastically changed our world and our way of life, but it's shining a bright light on our universal interconnectedness and our vulnerability to the seismic risks that have rocked our current capital market systems. Whether it be COVID-19 or the climate crisis, we're experiencing firsthand the need for collective action and mass mobilization to tackle these common global crises. And this is where you, as capital market leaders, are uniquely positioned to positively influence both our immediate response and our preparedness to help prevent future crises. And as government leaders look to economic recovery efforts, we must ensure that they also consider the systemic financial risks of a rapidly warming planet. We have the opportunity now to work with them to take action to avoid the worst impacts of the climate catastrophe that have been building over decades and then learn from the actions taken just over the last few months to address this global pandemic. Now is our chance to help safeguard our economy, communities and workers by ensuring that zero carbon industries not only withstand the downturn, but are incentivized to grow. This means that going forward, we must make financial decisions through the lens of climate resilience, and then also direct new dollars to net zero carbon solutions. But before we jump into this discussion, restitching our social fabric, how community leadership can tackle climate change, I have a few housekeeping notes. First, this session is being recorded, and so we'll provide all the participants with a link to the recording shortly after its completion. And secondly, if you have any questions for our speakers, please enter them in the chat box that's located on the right side of your screen in your control panel, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible after their initial discussion. So we know all too well that leadership matters in a time of crisis, and we're certainly in a crisis. And that is why I am incredibly honored to welcome and introduce our first speaker today, David Seamus. David is the Chief Executive Officer of the Obama Foundation, whose mission is to inspire, empower, and connect people to change their world. The foundation is a Chicago-based nonprofit organization founded by former President Barack Obama in 2014. Prior to this role, David served in the Obama administration as Deputy Assistant to the President, working with senior advisors like David Axelrod and David Pluff. He's also served as assistant to the president and director of the Office of Political Strategy and Outreach. Before serving in the White House, David was also the former Massachusetts governor's Deval Patrick's deputy chief of staff. David will be joined today by another extraordinary leader and visionary, Mindy Luber, series CEO and president, and my boss for an engaging one-on-one -on -one conversation, and then we'll open it up to take all of your questions. So let's get started. It's gonna be an inspiring session. Thank you so much and take it away, David. Don, thank you so much um, for the introduction, for what you do. Mindy, thank you so much for offering this platform uh, series and the series uh, community writ large. Thank you for what you do and all of the participants who have joined us today. Echoing what Don said at the beginning, 
Um, I am mindful sitting here in my home on the south side of Chicago on 48th and Woodlawn in the neighborhood of Hyde Park right near Kenwood, that if I look to my west um, about a mile, if I look to my south about a mile, if I look to the north, um, there uh, are hundreds if not thousands of people and families who are suffering uh, in a way that they just really haven't experienced before. And in a place like Chicago, where we have had hundreds of deaths, the fact that 70% of the deaths are African Americans, notwithstanding the fact that the African American community is 30% of Chicago, um, really speaks to uh, levels of disparity. Um, and frankly, the fraying of a civic and societal fabric as manifested in a place like Chicago, but we're seeing it throughout the world. And so when Mindy and I initially discussed um, um, speaking to you, uh, certainly we weren't in the middle of COVID, um, but we are now. Um, and so my heart, my sentiments uh, go out to any of you and to all of you who are experiencing what, what we all are at this moment. Uh, let me just quickly begin by um, saying that my, um, my parents are two Portuguese immigrants who came to the United States in 1968 and 1969. They escaped a fascist dictatorship in Portugal where there was no voting, there was no concept of citizenship or engagement or empowerment. One of the first memories that I have that stays with me to this moment was when my dad came to me and said that my mother who worked in a silver factory, she was 21 years of age in Taunton, Massachusetts, uh, someone had cut a corner on the maintenance of the machine and literally in less than a second, um, the machine malfunctioned and my mother lost fingers on her hands. When you are an immigrant, and this applies today in most cases, um, all you have are your hands and your back um, and what you can put into your day-to-day -day job. And so in a blink of an eye, those, as Barack Obama would say, those are audacious hopes that these two people had were uh, instantaneously disrupted. The thing that has always driven certainly my path is the memory that after that happened, on a nightly basis and on a daily basis, there were family, friends, co-workers, literally an entire community, a little ecosystem of Portuguese immigrant and beyond that community, who would check in and make sure that my mom was okay. That would make sure that my father, who still had to work in his factory job, was able to do that without worrying about their three or four year old son uh, at home. There's a real vivid memory that is being replayed millions of times today, both in the United States and hundreds of millions of times globally. That memory of basically when my parents fell, an entire community lifted them up was something that fast forward 30 plus years and as uh, I had the unbelievable honor of walking into the West Wing of the White House as an assistant to the President of the United States of America. Every day when I walked in the door and every night when I left, I repeated the same mantra to myself. It was a reminder. And what I said for all of those days was remember who you are and what you represent because I wasn't there, and this is an important, I think, reminder for all of us. I wasn't there because I was the brightest or even the most hardworking. There are always people who are smarter. There are always people who are more connected. There are always people who are more hardworking. I was there because in that moment when my parents fell and in subsequent moments when I fell, there was an entire community to lift me up and people like me up. I begin there because when I talk about community leadership, I want us to root 
immediately, not in a sense of this is only about elected officials. Um, this is not about the president of the United States, no matter who that person is. This isn't about a governor. This isn't about a mayor. This isn't about a senator. This isn't about a member of Congress. This is about what active citizenship requires. In moments like this, especially, and this applies, and we'll shift this into a discussion about the applicability to climate change. There has been an over-indexing in the notion that citizenship is simply a function of what my rights are. And we need to guard those zealously. That's fundamental and foundational. But there has been an under-indexing on what our responsibilities are, not just to ourselves, but to others. Because in a pluralistic democracy in the United States of America, where democracy essentially is a function of consent, an interdependent web of consent, not based upon race or ethnicity or on gender or ideology. It's a creed. We are a creedal nation, as a good friend of mine, Eric Liu, has written and said. A creedal nation based upon a document that begins with we, the people, we, not I not me, we. And so in moments like this, um, where we are all asked to isolate or to distance for the sake of our own health, there's also a deep understanding that that is an act of citizenship, that is an act of responsibility to what my actions mean for others, that is an act of leadership, not compliance, leadership. And that's the type of sometimes quaint but real responsibility that all Americans have as part of that um, bargain of being an American. And so orienting this discussion around, first of all, what leadership means. So that's the first thing. Let me take you now to October of 2016 when President Obama asked me to join uh, the Obama Foundation and to begin uh, my present role uh, along with the rest of the team. In that discussion, he began to, he said that he wanted to build an institution whose sole job was to inspire, empower, and connect people to change their worlds. Um, individual leadership from the bottom up. Because one of the things that he saw during the eight years of the presidency and that I saw serving with him during that period of time, and all of you know, given the work that you do on sustainability issues, the technical solutions to problems like climate change and education and poverty, there are policy solutions and there are technical solutions and there are science-based solutions that exist right now. We know what they are. We know the influence of the capital markets and what that can have on moving societal norms as it relates to energy use and sustainability. We know what they are. Here's what we lack, leadership. And I don't mean just in Washington, because in an era, certainly in the United States, where every discussion turns into not the best idea, however judged objectively, but into an in-group, out-group dynamic about, I don't even trust or believe what you are saying or the people who are saying that this is the thing we need to do. That speaks to this tearing and rendering and ripping of the social fabric upon which that consent is required. And so, the notion here is until we begin to restitch that civic fabric, until we begin to envision or re envision uh, our responsibility to each other as citizens, not just at, around the specter of voting, voting is the minimum, but in terms of the stake that I have uh, in you and that you have in me, this is why civic and community leadership at this moment in time is required 
not just in COVID as you are seeing exhibited throughout the country, but especially now as we begin to think about uh, climate change. So that's the second piece around uh, the civic fabric and the social fabric and what we are seeing and what some of the inhibitors are. So now here is the challenge and something I was discussing with Mindy and Don before we came on um, that gives me neither uh, optimism nor pessimism. It is what it is and we need to be clear eyed about it. There are now over 30,000 Americans who have died in the past six weeks. We are averaging between 1,500 and 2,000 Americans dying every single day. There have been some good indications that the curve is flattening. It is unclear what this means over the long term without widespread testing, contact tracing, isolation, in a very fundamental, uh, fundamentally different view of how we engage with one another in public. My point here is, even in the face of all of these debts, there are doubts about the underlying science. There's pushback around the question of whether or not even to distance or not. There's and there should be a good and vigorous debate about reopening an economy means. But if in, in this moment, that is as real and as a salient and right to the heart of what motivates people, fundamental questions of life and death, if that becomes muddied, even around the science of it, what does that mean for climate? What does that mean for all of us when we think about climate sustainability? To imagine where, unlike COVID-19, where there are, and it's real with people walking around with masks and maintaining six feet of distance and being locked in their homes and with unemployment spiking, another 5 million Americans released the number today, it's 22.2 million Americans who've lost their jobs in the past month. If that is not a moment for clear consensus, then we have work to do as we begin to think about the clear consensus around climate. So that's a challenge that I want to lay for everybody. Now, now that I've laid out the challenge, uh, I wanna lay out one view of how we begin to restitch that fabric. And it goes to um, a very bottom up approach that understands, as my old boss, the former governor of Massachusetts said, that every single human being has the ability to be primed to either turn to people or on people. All of us on a daily basis can be motivated to action or inaction based upon fear or hope based upon my assessment of someone being on my side or not on my side, on my assessment of whether or not I trust someone or I don't trust someone. We need to always begin these discussions with that fundamental concept of trust. You will never persuade anyone, notwithstanding all of the science, notwithstanding all of the data, notwithstanding any kind of argument that you can make, without building a baseline of trust. And so the first vector to think about is essentially trust as a function of relationships, collaboration, and discourse. When you approach either COVID or climate, please know that in terms of actions, um, when people hear a message, they will default to either a preconceived notion that they have based upon relationships that they have and or identity that they have. Um, or um, there will be something that will persuade them um, that even falls outside of those two component parts. So everything begins with a trust-based relationship first. Secondly, collaboration in terms of finding ways for people from disparate backgrounds and different disparate ideas to work together 
is a way then to enhance and build trust. Third, once you have that trust or the beginning of a trust with an individual, then you can begin to have difficult conversations. That's the discourse part. Because only with some kind of modicum of a relationship and trust can I say to you, well, you know what? I disagree with you. This isn't about disagreement. This is about trust. I am willing to engage with you because there is something that we have, a linkage that transcends this issue. And so foundational at an interpersonal level, as we engage in a climate conversation that's also about restitching the fabric, understand that this isn't a 30 or 40,000 foot discussion. This has to begin with a way to both build consensus and reinforce trust as you we're doing it. That's step one. Step two comes from wonderful work by Professor Jonathan Haidt um, around moral foundation theory. And the thing that I both learned in politics and we see across the board is that notwithstanding differences in culture, in norms and traditions, essentially most of us coalesce around five basic moral foundations. Harm, fairness, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. In every culture, whether you are in a remote tribal region in Papua New Guinea or on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, you can have cross-cultural conversations with people based upon notions of harm, notion, based on notions of fairness, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. As we are engaging in discussions around climate, please approach people in a way that speaks to what motivates them. For our conservative friends, for our progressive friends, there is a different emphasis that each puts on those moral foundations where many people are animated by discussions around loyalty or even authority. And I don't mean that in any kind of restrictive top-down way, but it is an animating value. Other people can be moved by notions of primarily a fairness or harm. Everyone is different. And these trust-based conversations need to have uh, different approaches. So that's the second piece. The third piece now is when we get into a discussion around climate in a way that helps to restitch that civic fabric. Um, we go back to notions of community organizing. And the way I like to think about it is there are four basic parts that I rely on on community organizing. There's issue mapping, there's power mapping, there's asset mapping, and then finally there's narrative. Issue mapping, imagine this. It is insufficient to simply go to someone and describe climate change and sustainability issues through the lens of the outcome that we're looking for. That essentially we need to have a certain percentage degree reduction or else bad things will happen. Yes. But when you're talking to ranchers or farmers or people in different backgrounds and different experiences, how do you talk about the issue? How do you map the issue in a way that speaks to them on a daily basis about something that matters to them? Climate for most people isn't about the reduction in degrees Celsius. It's about what it means to me and my family on a daily basis. That's issue mapping, power mapping. Once you decide that you want to engage in a campaign or in a plan or whatever the case may be, who ultimately are you focused on? Who holds the power to make the decision? And once that person receives the message, who are they gonna to turn to? Where does their power derive from? Is it legal? Is it regulatory? Is it financial? Is it reputational? Is it legacy-based? What is it? Map that. Because only with the mapping of it can you develop strategies that are in furtherance of what you are trying to do. Third step, asset mapping. You're all accomplished, uh, amazing people, but none of you can do anything alone. And so what are the different assets in people and organizations that you can bring to bear in the campaign or in the movement or in the effort that you're focused on? And then finally, 
narrative, which I alluded to earlier. You can have the best issue map, you can have identified the best way to think about power, you can bring together the best team, but human beings process via story. When we hear something, there is a hero, there is a villain, there is someone who has been hurt, there is a threat, and there is a resolution. What is the story that you are telling in a way that goes back to the way I began, that speaks to relationship and trust, that hits those moral foundations in a way that is consistent with your underlying values, and make sure that people, even as you're telling your story, they feel seen and heard and validated and are part of the solution and not simply someone to be manipulated or persuaded. And so um, to all of you and to Mindy, um, it's taken us a very long time to get to this place where, um, especially in this moment where we're having a crisis of public health, we are having a crisis of economic health, but underneath all of that, there is a question and a crisis of civic health. And uh, this is now the moment to begin in earnest uh, to not just address the first two, but to know that we have a responsibility to address the last one. And so um, thank you again for the opportunity and I look forward to the discussion uh, with all of you. So, Mindy. David, um, thank you. That was great. It gets us out of, you know, you're talking to us in many ways. And when I say us, series and the community and the way we talk about things, um, we do talk about getting to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Who knows what that means? I don't know what that means. Um, I know where we have to get, and we talk a lot about facts and figures and a trillion dollars here and $400 billion there. Um, and it's a great reminder that we have got to be able to connect with people. Um, I, I want to back up just a bit because the subject matter of what you're talking about, whether we're talking about pandemics or climate change or another virus that could come along, until we restitch the fabric of our society, um, we don't get there. We don't get there quickly enough. We don't find the solutions quickly enough. And we don't come together as a world community quickly enough to make a difference. Um, and it is the question for all of us is how do we rise above uh, partisanship and political issues and conservative versus socialist versus progressive? Um, we are talking about when it's COVID or climate change, human lives. We are talking about my neighbors, my relatives, the health of people that we're seeing on TV every day. And we're talking about whether everybody who owns property in Florida will have their property underwater, or whether the disease vectors change from climate alone, or whether or not we have hundreds of millions of immigrants, not the number now, when their homes become uninhabitable from climate change implications. Um, how did we get here and how do we get out of the fact that everything is viewed in the lens of you and me and partisanship and ours and these and eyes? This is our lives, our communities, our human friends, and they've become political bargaining chips. We have got to lift ourselves out of this um, on so many grounds if we're to have a future, regardless of which issue, which crisis we're talking about. How did we get here and really how do we begin to turbocharge our efforts out of this civil war in the United States of difference of opinions when this is not about Republicans or Democrats? This is about humanity. It's about my kids, your kids. Um, so some quick thoughts, just how do we move forward? Uh, so I haven't, Mindy, I haven't seen yet a and it's hard to quantify, it's hard to put your finger on one thing, but there are three trends that I think to me speak to the fraying and the ripping. Um, the first is um, a real economic dislocation 
um, in a transition that has been occurring for the past 30, 40 years. Uh, there are many books that, again, not at a macroeconomic level, but read Dignity, a wonderful book. Um, I'm going to mispronounce his name, but by Chris Arnade, I think, uh, where essentially he went first to the Bronx and then throughout the country and saw um, people who had worked in factories, like my mom and dad, um, people who had lived in uh, communities where there was a sense of cohesion. Um, and those communities have fallen apart. Uh, because economic opportunity has been um, disrupted um, in a way that is real and it's profound. And so that sense of, and please don't view this as a, a paycheck or even the fact that wages haven't kept up. A job is dignity. A job gives people a sense of worth. And more importantly, that sense that my children will do better than I will, for the first time in decades, if you ask people that question, the answer is no. That, so factor number one um, is around economic dislocation. Factor number two, um, there's, a, there's another book um, uh, called The Big Sort. And it describes how both around socioeconomic levels, ideological uh, levels and others, we're not even living near each other anymore. And here's what I'm, I remember growing up in Taunton, Massachusetts and the bank president for Bristol County Savings Bank lived two or three blocks away from the little immigrant enclave that I grew up in and his kids would play Little League Baseball um, with me and the rest of the immigrant kids. Um, that is really not happening that much anymore. We are sorting by ideology. Uh, there are, the book talks about super zip codes, where essentially if you look at Ivy League or Ivy League type graduates, where they are clustered, and then when you go into the zip codes and look where they are clustered, similar to where I am sitting right now, and I alluded to it at the beginning, there's a little enclave where we're separated from one another, where my children go to private schools and not to the Chicago public schools, right? And so what does that result in? That results in not just we're different, but an otherization that occurs along different lines in the three lines that are the most dangerous to otherize around are um, uh, essentially race, religiosity, and socioeconomics. And, all, and many of there's an interplay among and between uh, all of them. The third factor that um, uh, is real, and I don't know that anybody has a real good answer for it, is, let me do it this way. In the period after World War II, up until the mid-1970s, early 1980s, it was a very unique moment in American media, especially news, where essentially for this brief moment in time, there were three networks, where on a nightly basis and on a daily basis, all Americans essentially would listen to the story, the shared experience that comes from the story, where the final episode, and I'm dating myself and others, the final episode of MASH um, had more people watching than watch the Super Bowl. Today, it is a fraction of that, where when I leave this call, I have the ability to get my information and news from thousands of different sources and my human nature is to go to those that reinforce my worldview. So you put these three trends together of massive economic dislocation, massive geographic and societal dislocation and segregation, 
and then a segregation and a disaggregation of a consistent story, story and thought. And essentially it puts us here uh, where we are. And so that's the closest that I've seen people really coalesce about some of the driving forces. Mindy, the only way that I have seen that people can essentially reverse engineer that, uh, because we will never go back to three networks, nor would we want to, um, is essentially to find a way, even via information means, um, and it begins with education, to make sure that people are simply not looking at things through their tribal lens and distinction. I am an American first. And what that means to me and what it means to you, and we have a stake in one another. And so this is this is a decades long piece of work. It's uh, a recreation of institutions at a local level, at a state level, at a national level. Um, what does that look like? There, there are groups, David Brooks, who's a columnist for the New York Times, is highlighting people he calls weavers, people who are weaving that civic fabric back together. Folks like Tim Shriver um, um, is imagining a group called Unite. Uh, discussions between the Koch Brothers Foundation and foundations on the left about what can we do to restitch the fabric. And so what, what gives me hope is that not just right now in COVID, but essentially I'm beginning to see, we're beginning to see across political and ideological lines, people sitting back and saying, you know what? This isn't sustainable and consistent with what you said. How can we ever move broadly in a way around collective action with something like climate change? without having at least that modicum of shared interest and shared belief um, in a way that will require it. And so I am guilty like many, if not most, of uh, over-indexing on the diagnosis of the problem, at least the way I see it uh, humbly, um, um, but essentially the experimentation of what the solution is, is something that um, you're seeing groups like the Obama Foundation and others beginning to exercise uh, throughout the country. Well, let's think about how to take what, it is one of the most compelling challenges we have, restitching the fabric of our society. So people can talk to each other, hear each other, listen to each other. Right now, regardless of the narrative, we're not capturing whether it's climate change or water shortages, things that eventually will look like the COVID pandemic to us um, in different ways, but could have the same systemic fracturing um, of our social fabric. So how do we get ready? Um, these, these are big issues um, to say the least. And when you think about climate, whether you try and explain it as uh, Puerto Rico, L look what the weather, the dy dynamic climatic changes have done. They've taken a community and devastated it. And we've seen a lot of that community come together. Uh, but how do we learn from it? I'm not sure we have, even though tens of thousands of people are still suffering with less energy, with less heat, without being able to reopen um, their businesses that were devastating. So. Um, I'm with you, I'm with you on everything you're saying, but on climate and we're using that, it, it really is um, an example of so many other things. We've got the life experiences and we should do better with the narrative of telling that story because facts and figures and this many um, gigawatts of power don't have a lot of meaning. Uh, but we have yet to break through. Um, and, and part of it is you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't feel it. Part of it is, if you're not immersed in studying it, you could think it's 10 years off or 20 years off. And the notion that if we don't act now, um, well, you could wait and act later, that's really not accurate, but 14 people know that and the rest of the community and more than 14, of course, but the rest of the world doesn't. Um, it, it's so important to think practically, 
to take these concepts that you're talking about because they make extraordinary sense. When somebody trusts you, you could have disagreement, you could have facts. We all do it at the Thanksgiving dinner table because we trust and love the people at that table with us. Um, how do we, not over 10 years, but over a short term, start having that discussion? As you know, it's serious. We spend a lot of time trying to work with some of the largest corporate leaders, financial leaders, um, and talk their language. You know, why does climate and water have a massive impact like COVID is having and how does it? Um, but this is bigger than that. It's how do we talk to people so we start acting. The key is acting before it's too late and yes. learning from the experience we're having now. Uh, Mindy, um... Uh, one person's um, one person's opinion, but I've I've seen this um, play out in so many different ways. Um, um, we need to stop calling people science deniers. We need to stop calling people climate deniers. Here's why. Are you going to persuade someone or even someone who has a doubt about something by basically uh, attacking them in whatever perspective that they have? Because what happens to the mind and what happens from basic psychology is as soon as you move into that type of attack and questioning even of my motives, I shut down and turn off. You will never get me or people like me to agree with you, putting aside the facts and the figures and the arguments once you begin there. With an issue this important, being able to say, essentially why this is important, not just to you and others, it has to be that way. So let me give you an example. Um, there is this wonderful organization called Narrative 4. Narrative 4 does an empathy exchange, and it's rooted in the idea that in order to get trust, there are two preconditions. The first is empathy. The second is compassion. Empathy simply is, I'm feeling what you're feeling. I'm connected with you. Compassion is, I'm feeling what you're feeling and I see that you're suffering and I want to do something about it. Then you have trust once you begin to do something about it. So the exercise that Narrative 4 does is essentially, Mindy, you and I are sitting across from one another. I open up to you about what's important to me. You open up to me about what's important to you. I then stand up in front of a group of people and tell your story in the first person. If you and I have never met each other and we spend four minutes exchanging stories and then I stand up and I have to tell your story as Mindy Luber, something happens to people in terms of even the connection that we're making with one another. And so beginning a climate discussion that ultimately is about changing societal perspective and norms from a perspective of empathy. If there is someone who is skeptical or doubting, acknowledge the skepticism and the doubt. I hear you. I understand where you're coming from. Because only when someone is able to feel as if their skepticism or doubt has been validated or heard, not insulted, not attacked, will they even be open to learning in a discussion. This is just, in many ways, who we are. Once we do that, from a uh, broad message perspective, now you're in the position to find out who are the right validators. Um, because here's the risk, especially in a climate context. If any of the facts are disputed or, or, or are wrong, those who are predisposed to doubt will anchor immediately on that one thing that was either overstated or misstated or wrong to say, I discount everything else. Why is that the case? Because I don't have a reason to trust you and therefore the one indication of doubt allows me to, from a 
perspective of motivated reasoning, say, why well, I didn't have to trust you to begin with. So what do you need to do? What do all of us need to do? In every community, in every state, and in every industry throughout the country, there are people who are trusted validators. And I don't mean just the CEO or a political official. You can go into a community in Florida and you can find a Republican or a Democratic business owner who has more trust than the governor or the senators or anyone else. And essentially they become the proxies. They are the ones then where that man or woman sitting at home in Florida who is hearing a climate discussion, if they hear it from someone that they already have some kind of localized connection with, of trust, then they're willing to, as we discussed over Thanksgiving, I may disagree with you, but I trust you. This isn't about agreement, this is about trust. And so structuring what we need to do around these trusted validators um, is super important. The third thing that I think um, uh, is also um, uh, crucial, um, and it speaks to what I said to earlier about turn to or turn on and aspiration versus fear. Um, if we don't act soon, it will be a catastrophe. There's no question about it. It's real. Um, but there is another way to tell the story. There is a way to talk about those instances where Americans, in the face of challenges, what we do and what we can do when we come together. That even notwithstanding these, this is who we are. This is, these are the moments that when America comes together, we tackle any of these challenges. This is a moment for collective hope and collective action because of the threat, right? And so this is the, this is the other thing that you see in people, especially when there is skepticism and doubt. Um, where if they believe that there is a dark overstatement, and I have heard people in focus groups basically say things like, really, what can we possibly do to change the weather? Right? Obviously, those are very different discussions, but as opposed to something um, speaking to people's sense of hope, and optimism and pride in what Americans can do when we uh, come together. And so um, that's the way, Mindy, that I believe that we can speak to individuals understanding the way they come at things, uh, right? Empathy, trusted validators, and um, a message about turning to one another um, in an aspirational way. All of which makes great sense, David. There's no question about that. And the opportunities, again, if we're talking about climate, from jobs to new industries to new businesses, it is the future of our economy without question. Um, so you sat at both ends of the spectrum, and the ends that I'm referring to are the top, meaning the White House. How do you move things with leadership, policy, regulatory changes? And now you're talking about how to touch your neighbors. And, and we all know we need to do both. You know, I've spent my life as a young lawyer worrying about, you know, do you litigate or do you lobby or do you do research or you need to do it all. There's no question when we're talking about some of life's biggest challenges. Um, but, but where do we begin? We need the leadership. We know that we're seeing it with the COVID crisis. We've seen it with many other challenges. Uh, and we need to talk to our neighbors. And how, how do we reach that, those two levels, if we're gonna focus on a big problem, needs to be better defined and really better integrated into people's lives. Um, a limited period of time to act before the problem gets perhaps unmanageable. Um, and hundreds of things we could do. We could try and renegotiate with China. We could try and move India. We could. You know, this is a global problem. 
uh, do we go local or, or do we go global or is it somewhere in between? Um, and if we can't do it all at once, where do we start? Well, we have to do it. We have to do it all at once. Um, you know, I um, I referred to a power map uh, earlier, and um, it's incumbent upon um, everyone, especially people participating on this webinar, uh, to understand that even if there are elected officials who are um, either in office or running for office, no matter what the office is, who have previously said something uh, or taken positions that run counter to what we believe is the right approach to climate, um, the irresponsible thing to do is to write them up. Um, you cannot write off, and this is a gross oversimplification, uh, 50 percent of the power structure of the elected leaders in the United States of America. Uh, you can't. Um, and so when you think about a notion of a power structure and incentive systems, the development of relationships with every single person running for office, in office right now, no matter what position they have previously said, to continuously go back at them and to find the way that aligns with their worldview and their incentive system and the way they think about their politics and the way they think about their perception of what is good or bad for the country. That is a responsibility that we have. Because simply then to default and say, I am writing you off and instead I'm gonna to try to defeat you no matter what. And that's what elections are for. And that's a good generation of ideas, and that's the way it is. But without those bridges, without that uh, opening to continue the discussion, which is primary to any good negotiation, always keep the line open. Always keep the discussion going, because when that moment arises where incentives are aligned and there are relationships, then you can move. And so um, I think that is a crucially important way to deal with leaders, uh, especially in an elected context, um, even as we move in terms of uh, folks on the ground, because the interesting thing here from a leverage perspective, in an era where climate unfortunately is viewed through the lens of partisan politics, if you can move folks in a leadership position, then you can begin to see because of trust the way many other people on the ground in the grassroots would begin to move. Not naive. Um, right. uh, that is a difficult thing to do. But what's the alternative? And there is no alternative. You, you have nailed it. Tell me about your work is quite important. And as you think about it at the Obama Foundation, and as I mean, we work with companies and investors, we agree on Tuesday, we don't agree on Wednesday, but we trust each other. We develop relationships to disagree uh, and to push and to push each other hard in a respectful way. Um, tell me about the foundation and how you're bringing people together and how perhaps some of the companies and investors we work with might be part of that narrative and that discussion. Because they're leaders, they're thought leaders who are speaking to hundreds of thousands of employees, millions of customers. These are thoughtful people um, who are spending a lot of time with us trying to find ways to come together, sometimes on things we do not agree on. But there, mm. there's trust and faith and wisdom and leadership. No question, Mindy. Um... I'll give you two programs. One is our Africa Leaders Program, and then the other is our uh, Asia Pacific Leaders Program as a preview of coming attractions for the United States. Um, we have convened 200 leaders between the ages of 25 and 40 on the African continent. 45 of the 54 nations are represented. 15% um, of them are doing work around climate and sustainability. 
we convened 200 leaders in the Asia Pacific region from 33 nations throughout the region. 20% of them are doing work around climate and sustainability issues. This year, although it will be virtual, we will convene 200 European leaders from throughout the continent. Next year, the plan is then to expand uh, to Latin America and South America. And then after that, imagine a North American or United States-based uh, leaders program. And so by in five years or in 10 years, you will have on a yearly basis a new cohort of a thousand or more Obama leaders, not left, not right, not Democratic, not Republican, the most promising young leaders on the planet who are coming together both around issues that they care about and around their regions where they live, but unified under what we began with. Leadership that has people turn to each other rather than on each other. And so for all of you listening, um, as you think about the only way to restitch that civic fabric, both in the United States and globally, our bet, the president's bet, Mrs. Obama's bet, is literally if we find tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and ultimately millions of people over the course of the next five, 10, 15, 20 years, and create the largest network of global values-based change makers that the planet has ever seen, these individuals then act as nodes of trust in the communities that they live in, but insofar as they're connected together, Mindy goes to what you talked about, the top and the bottom, because I have every confidence that in those 200 Africa leaders and 200 Asia leaders that we convened already, there are prime ministers there. There are presidents there. There are heads of NGOs. There are business leaders. There are people who will make their communities, their countries, and ultimately the world better. And so uh, I'll just conclude with a line that uh, President Obama had in his farewell speech in Chicago in January of 2017. He said, I'm asking you to believe once again not in my ability to bring about change, but in yours. But the most powerful word in American democracy is the word we. And we need to get back to that sense of the things that we have in common are so much greater than the things that make us different. And that's the promise and that's why we're building what we're building. David, I'd like to say something wise, but trying to uh, one up the president, uh, President Obama in this case would be foolish of me. Those words are just so touching and what we're talking about. And I am certain that there's opportunity as we move ahead to think about where we can work together. There are hundreds of thousands of employees of many of these companies, investment houses, who I bet would be perfect for your mentorship program. So. Uh, keep up the extraordinary work. We will find ways to build together um, and to learn from each other. It is about we. Uh, I'm thrilled that you were here today with us. I'm going to turn Mindy, it back. Thank you, Don. Thank you. And thank you to Ceres for what you're doing. Um, it's a great honor. Thank you. Don, we're not hearing you. Thank you so much for your inspiring words, David and Mindy. We will do this thing. And thank you to all of you for taking part in today's session. Before we close, I just have to thank our sponsors that you'll see here on the screen who have provided instrumental support for Series 2020. And as a reminder, you'll all be receiving an email with a video recording of this session. For those of you who want to continue to be a part of Series 2020, uh, there's another session scheduled for Monday, April 20th on Innovative Approaches to Sustainable Finance. To register and learn more about that and other upcoming sessions, please go to www.series2020.org. Thank you again, David. It's been a pleasure and an inspiration. This session is now adjourned. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Be well.